Well, hello, everybody. I'm going to bring this meeting to order. It's great to see all the little comments in the chat there and to see the panelists. Hello, hello, panelists. It's great to see everybody. Um, I am Catherine Blakespear, as you probably know, but it's my great honor to serve here as the mayor in the city of Encinitas and to welcome you to this Zoom event with Catherine and friends. Uh, so friends, of course, being the people on the panel and all of you who are joining us. Uh, it's really a special occasion for this all-star group of elected officials to be together all at the same time to talk with us. We have our congressman, we have our assembly member, we have two city council members, and we have a supervisor. And all of these people make decisions that affect us here in Encinitas. And I'm thrilled that they are here to answer our questions and to support me in my reelection. I also really like them. Uh, so I have a personal relationship with all of them. I consider them friends. And all of us working at these different levels of government to tackle all of the problems that confront us here in Encinitas and in all cities is um, what we're working on. So there are always problems and we're working together on it from all different levels of government. So you'll hear from the elected officials today and I'm going to ask that you put your questions if you have any in the Q&A at the bottom. Uh, not in the chat as much as the Q&A because it's easier to keep organized and not lose them. Um, I'm going to be turning it over to Supervisor Nathan Fletcher, who I see has joined us, which is great. But first, before I do that, I just want to highlight what a tremendous job Supervisor Fletcher is doing at the County Board of Supervisors. He has been there less than two years, but he has completely revitalized the energy on that board. And during this coronavirus pandemic, it's really his leadership and his clarity and ability to summarize in his communications what is happening that has really been on full display. And I think Supervisor Fletcher is one of his great strengths is that he understands how to make change and he's prodigious in the areas he works on. So I see him working on transit, on air quality, homelessness, um, law enforcement, healthcare and jails, um, and then even regulations around vaping. So Supervisor Fletcher took the time to come to Encinitas where these are residents that he doesn't even directly represent, but to talk to our youth commission about vaping because he cares about that and he wants to see uh, improvements in that area throughout the county. So I'm thrilled to have his support for my reelection and to, hand, to get the ball rolling, I'm gonna hand it over to Supervisor Fletcher. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Catherine, so much. Look, we're here, uh, to, thank you for that wonderfully kind uh, introduction, but we're here today to support you. Um, and and it's it's my great honor and, and and privilege to to be here to support you and and you know for everyone on the call um, you know so many of you are here because you support Catherine but I can't tell you how much who we elect matters um, at every level and 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 the, the 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 mayors who we have in our cities are vital components and are critical uh, to our entire regional success and when Catherine calls me I know she's going to have a substantive issue. She's going to have a solution. She's going to have something. And I know at the end of the day, when she calls me, I'm going to end up supporting it. Um, and, and that has tremendous value for who we are as a region and where we go. And so I think that, you know, while sometimes our, our federal races, and I see uh, Congressman Levin, who we love and we all work so hard, uh, or the city of San Diego mayor's race, uh, tend to sometimes get a lot of the media attention. These, these races are important. And, and, and what happens in your city uh, sets a barometer and a bellwether for, for what happens across the county. And, you know, and Catherine, we have someone who we know is a leader. Uh, we know someone who is very collaborative with other cities. She's very collaborative with getting the county on board, getting us on board, getting us all together to try and, and figure out what those things are. Uh, but one of the things that I really, really deeply respect about, about Catherine Blakespear is she is action oriented and results focused. And, and that's what mayors do. Um, and she is not afraid to lean into difficult issues and that that willingness to to put yourself out there you know it's the easiest thing in politics to kind of sit back and watch and see what shapes up and figure out which way the wind's blowing but when you're willing to lean into difficult things and i've watched her do this time and again on homelessness uh, on housing i've watched her lean into the covid debate in a in a community that hasn't always been on the, on the same page surrounding that but the ability to be a leader on transportation issues um, is something that is so vitally important to our region. And 
the role she plays in her city, but the role she plays as a regional leader uh, is really important. And I, I am so proud of everything, uh, Catherine, that you were doing. And it is, it is, uh, is my, my honor to support you and encourage everyone else uh, to please do that. She needs our financial support. She needs our donations. She needs our help. Uh, so, because we have a true champion uh, of the environment, uh, of a progressive approach to what we're doing, of an understanding of what the next generation of transportation is going to look like and where we need to go. And so, Catherine, I couldn't be more pleased to uh, to be here with you to uh, join uh, my friend Congressman Levin and, and so many other folks who I know uh, is on there. And, and we look forward to getting you reelected. Uh, and I look forward to getting some change at the county where we'll have a little bit more uh, ability to work with you and advance our shared interests. So it's my my privilege to, uh, to be here today. And again, everyone out there, please donate. This is a fundraiser. Uh, it's fun and it's nice. We're all hanging out uh, and it's nice that we all, we all love Catherine. But now is the time where we show her that by actually making a donation. And, and I know a number of individuals out there, I know Lucinda Lee, uh, Jesse, uh, Neil, uh, Brewington, uh, Laura, Antioch, so many of you have donated. We need everyone on, and I'm gonna come back and call out the rest of you to donate. So right now, in the chat is the, is the address. We're asking you to go online. I'm gonna do it while the next person speaks. It is time to get out our wallets and checkbooks and put our money where our mouth is, because running for office is hard. And asking for money is hard. And we're here to support Catherine, and so we wanna do that, not, not with just sitting on a Zoom, uh, but actually in whatever amount you can give going on online and making a donation. So Catherine, thank you for letting me join you. And uh, uh, now I'm going to turn it back to you, uh, our, our mayor, our leader, uh, real coastal representative, someone speaking for the entire region, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Well, thank you so much for that um, introduction and the enthusiasm. I, I really appreciate that. I, I want to say a little bit about the city and my candidacy before I turn it over to the other panelists. Um, so that you have a, a fuller picture. So as some of you know, um, I come from a family who's been contributing to this Encinitas community for four generations. So my husband and I have two kids and they are fifth generation Encinitans. They are going into seventh and sixth grade. And that kind of legacy in a place in Southern California is, is unusual. My great grandparents grew flowers uh, like many of the original families in Encinitas. And my grandpa worked as a contractor and then both of my parents were lawyers and I am also a practicing lawyer. I've been the mayor for close to four years now and we've really focused on the areas that need it. So it's important to lay out the foundation of a city, I think, before focusing on what we've really been working on. So Encinitas remains and has been one of the safest cities in the county. We're just behind Poway with the lowest amount of crime of the 18 cities in the county. And we're also financially very sound. So that means that we don't get into too much debt. We have not taken on too much debt. We don't get overextended with either our employee costs or our capital costs. Uh, and we know that that budget is the backbone of any organization. So it's really important to me and to the colleagues that I serve with and to the professional staff that we always remain committed to that financial responsibility. I'll also say in the face of coronavirus, finances uh, have become uncertain for many cities. And I read about it in the newspaper every morning. I'm grateful that we have received financial assistance from the county. So thank you, Supervisor Fletcher and your colleagues for distributing some directly to cities. Um, I predict that we will be able to maintain our financial stability in Encinitas and not have to cut key things like our um, capital projects or, or law enforcement or parks or programming uh, because basically our city is not heavily dependent on sales tax and hotel tax. So most of our general fund does come from our property taxes and that is not predicted to, to decline very much. So the things that I've prioritized together with my city council colleagues, they revolve around the environment, uh, transportation improvements, Finally, getting an approved housing plan after multiple failed plans and years of litigation, and us trying to do more to help those in need. So some examples of uh, within that are, we now have a gold standard climate action plan, and we were founding members of the county's first community choice energy program. Uh, so that's great because we will end up, when you flick on the light, it'll be greener sources of that energy uh, and not burning of fossil fuels. We've also really focused on transportation improvements like building the coastal rail trail, uh, barrier protected bike lanes on Highway 101, green bike lanes and improvements under free, our freeways at Santa Fe and Encinitas Boulevard, 
and road improvements really throughout the city, as well as trail improvements in Alevenhine. And finally, we approved the county's first parking lot uh, for people who find themselves without a home, but they still own a car in order for them to stay safely overnight. And I'll say that in summary, these things, they can sound obvious or almost expected that we would do these things, but in reality, they were difficult to accomplish. They required that political will and courage in order to move forward. And I think that as mayor, my track record, it speaks for itself. I try to bring an analytic approach to problems. I think I do bring an analytic approach to problems. I listen closely to a wide variety of public opinions. And then I'm clear about the need to make forward progress. So we hear uh, politicians criticized saying talk is cheap. We want to see results. And I believe residents want that. And so even when it's hard, moving that ball up the hill, moving forward on things is really important. I also work really hard to bring out the best in my colleagues. I'm always a partner to them, my colleagues on the city council, and then the professional staff who really does all the work, and then all the outside boards as well, the county leaders that I serve with. I encourage them to lead and to help support them when they have passion and insight about changes that they would like to see in the city. And ultimately, elections are how we resolve our values disputes. So what's important to us? And my record demonstrates that I strike that right balance between preserving what is so great about our city and innovating to meet the moment. Because we find ourselves with challenges, challenges that face all cities like homelessness. And I'm dedicated to working to solve those problems. So I'm, I would be honored to have your vote and your donation today. I'm thrilled that you're here to listen to me and the other panelists. And I want to really thank the many, many people who have already donated <coughs> to help reelect me. We've had great success already, and we need to keep that momentum going. So I'm going to throw it back to Supervisor Fletcher before we hand it over to our assembly member, Tasha Berner Horvath. All right. So before we go to Tasha, I want to thank a couple other folks who, uh, who donated uh, during, during the time we've been online here. I want to thank Joy Lindes, uh, Catherine uh, Stenger, uh, Maria Fridas. Uh, Ralph uh, Cheney, uh, Niels Lund, Felicia Tobias, Barbara Bolton, Nathan Fletcher. I see him there. Right. I, I knew that one. Um, and again, please, whatever you can give, uh, go online. And, and uh, the, the challenge of running, you know, I, I often call people and say, look, I need you to help and support me. And they go, oh, I don't know. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, you make the calls all day long to raise the money. You take this. Well, I don't want to do that. I said, well, if you don't want to do that, then you need to donate and help me. I'll do it for you. Um, and Catherine does it for us every day. Um, and so please, in, in whatever amount, I know the times are tough for a lot of folks, uh, but who we elect is vitally important. And so please, please go online. The link is in the chat. And uh, please help us continue to, uh, to raise money and, and, and help Catherine. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to our assembly member, Tasha Berner Horvath. She is doing important work in the assembly right now and has to go at 5 p.m., which is just 15 short minutes. But I just want to say she's a dear friend. I could not be more proud to have our former city council member representing us in the state assembly. When I was newly elected to the city council, Tasha made an appointment with me to discuss a stop sign near a local <laughs> elementary school. And I identified her right away as someone with the qualities of a public servant. So I encouraged her to apply for the planning commission and to run for city council. And now look at her. She was, she's only been there two years. She also needs our support in her reelection. She was able to get us a million dollars in for her whole district dedicated to homelessness for the community resource center to hire housing navigators and expand that program. And she also authored a bill that the governor signed that gives women more opportunities to serve on boards and commissions, which is really walking the talk. So I want to thank Tasha for being here today and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for supporting Catherine. You have such a great group of people, both the participants and in this fundraiser, as well as our panelists. Catherine, I would literally not be in Sacramento today without you. So I'm not sure if I blame you or thank you. It depends on the day. Um, but, you know, I was thinking back when we were doing meet and greets in 20. 16. And to think uh, from all those meet and greets we did, I, I think you did way over, I think I did like 30 meet and greets and you might have done way twice that many, three times that many when you were first running for mayor. And we've now come to this place. And when Catherine says she does identify leaders, literally I went to go show 
the stop sign and why that stop sign was important. And we were riding our bikes back and she said, have you thought about running for council? And I was like, no, I've not thought about running for council, but she is that person. And that's what leaders do. Leaders go and they see what's best. And, and Catherine has this ability to look past all the things and all the noise in the city and find what's best in people and bring that out and find what's, out, find what's best for our city and bring that out and find what's best for our region and bring that out. And there, I have to tell you, there's not like that many people, most of them are on the call, um, not that many people that do that. And so we are very fortunate to have somebody like Catherine as our mayor. I always call her the best mayor ever. Um, and she competes with a couple of mayors, but then we have like little fights and we're like, my mayor is the best, but I think I win. And that's because she leads not only on the issues that are important to our city, but for the issues that are important to our region. And when we have those voices, it means makes it so much easier for me to do the work serving our community in Sacramento. I work with Nathan Fletcher. He's been great. I want to echo all of Catherine's comments on Nathan. I didn't even know that that's what a Democrat on our board of supervisors could look like. And I am so thankful for Nathan's leadership during this time. And, and so, you know, it's something I discovered once I was elected is that our power is not additive. Our power is exponential. So it's not two plus two equals four. It's nine times nine equals 81. It is, it goes up at the more we get. And so having these multiple levels of leadership are really so important um, for our city, which I still call home. Uh, so I, I care about it for, for my own family. I'm still, I'm still that community leader. Um, but also really reelecting Catherine is the best thing we could do. And I'll be frank, this isn't gonna be an easy election. She faces a, 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 an opponent who we need to make sure that the small minority of people who oppose anything are not outnumbered, that they're not outnumbered by those of us who choose not to act. So we have to make sure that we outnumber those of us who do think we want to protect our environment, who do think we wanna make sure that we're helping the most vulnerable, that we do wanna make sure that we're thinking about every opportunity to really preserve where we came from. My family has been in Encinitas for three generations, um, you know, and, but know where, lead where we're going. And cause our path is forward, it's never gonna be back. And so having a leader like Catherine makes all the difference. So if you haven't donated, I'm gonna join the, the Fletcher bad wagon here. Please go ahead and go online and donate now. Um, you really need to make sure, even if it's $5, if you could only get $5, I know times are super tough, $5 now, $10. You can make a monthly reoccurring donation where you do $5 every month. That's fine too. You know, Whatever you can do, please do to help Catherine get reelected. Because I can tell you, without Catherine, I will not be nearly half as effective in Sacramento for you and for our district because she is that voice. And, and we don't always agree, but... I think the fact that we have that dialogue, that is what makes her a powerful leader is that she really does listen to people with a lot of different perspectives and that she brings that to every conversation um, and her passion for doing, you know, what's right and going forward is amazing. So uh, with that, well, I'll turn it back to Catherine and I am so appreciative thanks. of everything. Thank you so much, Tasha, for all of your comments. And I just, before you leave, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, so, um, Encinitas, like many coastal cities, faces the threats from sea level rise. And so I would like to just ask you about your thoughts and insights on what you're, what you're doing, what you're working on, or what you think about how we can manage this inevitability of sea level rise. Yeah, I think um, it is an, um, the nexus of sea level rise, climate change, um, protecting our natural resources, um, how that relates to housing and transportation and, and where jobs are, that is, it all comes together. And I'm the chair of the Select Committee on Sea Level Rise in the California Economy, and we held two hearings um, last year. And, it's so, and, and what we found out, the first one was in Encinitas, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for having us there. Um, and what we know is with climate change, the best thing we can do now is reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So every policy that we look at, looking at through a climate lens and saying, how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions now? That's number one, that's the best thing we can do. The second thing is, I think when we talk, when we look at projects like um, 
what we have down at um, Seaside and, oh, Catherine, help me out. What's the name of the project? I'm, I'm totally blanking on the project's name. Uh, the, Cardiff um, Reef? The sand yeah, Cardiff Reef. The sand dunes. The Cardiff Reef. That is one of the largest soft um, and environmentally sensitive protections for Highway 101 in the entire state. And by having a project like that, we are demonstrating that there are ways to be environmental and still protect our infrastructure. And I think the infrastructure costs of sea level rise will be enormous. I think we were estimating them at $150 billion in the state with probably 300 billion if you take into account groundwater rise, which is something that came out in my second hearing was we had a professor from Berkeley that says, and it's like natural, right? As, as sea levels rise, groundwater rises and you get saltwater intrusion. That affects a city like Encinitas that is very coastal and is surrounded by water in a way that it doesn't affect other places. And so we need to be really looking at what is the science and tying science to guiding our policies. Um, but the most, the best thing we can do now is reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So great job on the CCA. I think that's a, a great thing going forward, a great accomplishment for the region. Uh, I'll put in a pitch to National Fletcher that, you know, I think there can be more partners uh, in the CCA. Um, but, you know, as we look forward to this, we need to do and invest more in, in that infrastructure and protecting that infrastructure and knowing where that infrastructure um, is most vulnerable and having a scientific way of analyzing that. So it's a kind of technocratic um, answer to it, but we have to pr protect all no, the things okay. that made our community special. And it's very scientific. Like when you get into the data, which you, you all know me, so you know I love getting into the data. When you get into that, you start seeing the decisions we make now and the leaders we have now who are looking at things through a climate lens, those communities will be more resilient at the end of the day when you're looking at the climate lens. And when the regions look at things through a climate lens and looking at re reducing greenhouse gas emissions and how do we you know, look at you know, groundwater rise, saltwater intrusion, you know, how do we do, you know, the protecting of our infrastructure, whether that's Highway 101 or our rail corridor, all the things that connect us and our emergency services, it really is impactful. So that's why having a leader like Catherine is so important is because she does look at everything with that lens. And with her at the helm, I know our community will be safer and our community will be more resilient to in climate and fighting climate change. So um, I hope that well, answers your you question. thank you so much, Tasha. <laughs> yeah. And, and also Ta Tasha is running for re-election and her, she is over there in the chat. There's um, Tasha's website, donate to Tasha. She is fighting the fight. We need her. So please c contribute and support her as well. Um, and I know she's off now shortly to go to a uh, five o'clock hearing. So yes, yeah, sorry, but, but thank everybody, you, thank you so much for joining us. Please and, donate to Catherine. Okay, so I have to have her as my partner in Encinitas. I beg you. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll throw it back to Supervisor Fletcher, and then we'll go to our Congressman Levin. So before we go to uh, to Congressman Levin, who knows a thing or two about winning tough elections and really changing a region and and everything he's done, I, I want to I really appreciate Mike's effort uh, on a variety of issues, but in particular for our veterans. Uh, when I call him on a veterans issue, he's there, and they're proactive, they're aggressive, they're fighting for our folks up there. And uh, as someone who has a son at Camp Pendleton. Uh, what we're doing to help them uh, really, really, really means a lot. Um, and uh, so I'm very grateful for that, Mike, in addition to everything else you do and for taking the time to come in and, and support our local candidates. Um, you know, you did that for me and I'm very grateful for it when I was running in a tough race and you're doing it for Catherine. And it really means a lot to have your members of Congress show up uh, to help us in these local races. So thank you for that. Um, all right, we're gonna we're gonna name some other folks, and uh, now the scary part is what happens after Mike speaks. When I come back and name all the folks on the call who haven't donated, uh, and you you don't want to be on that list. So the the way you avoid being on that list is between now and when we come back, you go online and you give something. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Nikki uh, Fadik, uh, Name Name Name. I hope I got that right. Woodward, thank you. Uh, Michael and Nancy von Newman, uh, Eric Amundsen, Peter Davis, Tom Packard, uh, Malika. Uh, Marston, Susan Sherrod, and James Stiven, thank you so much for donating. Again, the limits are $250, um, and that's the max, but anything that you give in there, uh, the Marines, we always said ounces make pounds. Uh, you understand that when you're, when you're packing your pack to go to the field, and so whatever it is, uh, you can go in and donate. Please do that now. The link is in the chat, 
And uh, we're going we're gonna to make sure Catherine gets off to a strong start with a good fundraiser here tonight. So uh, with that, Catherine, I will turn it back to you to introduce Congressman Levin. And again, thank you all for uh, donating. We'll be back in a few. OK, thank you. So I, I'm very excited to introduce our Congressman, Congressman Mike Levin. He is a stellar representative for Encinitas and the rest of the 49th. I was thrilled to have the change from Congressman Daryl Issa to Congressman Mike Levin. It is literally night and day. He's everything you would want in your congressman. He's smart. He was an environmental attorney before becoming a congressman. He's very deeply engaged with his constituency and dedicating to solving his district's problems, some of which are very difficult, like nuclear waste at San Onofre. And we all need to make sure we do everything in our power to reelect Congressman Levin as well. And I'm thrilled to have you here today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here for uh, one of the finest uh, elected officials in San Diego County, uh, Catherine Blakespear, who's just done an amazing job for the city of Encinitas. Uh, I want to thank uh, our great supervisor, Nathan Fletcher, for all his leadership, particularly in this time of COVID-19. Uh, he has been a great, great leader uh, for our entire region. And uh, I think we'll look back and uh, we will remember his uh, early leadership uh, as uh, San Diego County dealt far better with the pandemic than many places throughout the state and throughout the nation. I think Nathan Fletcher had a huge amount to do with that, continues to have a huge amount to do with that. So I really, really thank Nathan. And we desperately need to get another Democrat or two elected to the County Board of Supervisors to serve with Nathan. Uh, and Tasha Berner Horvath, if you're still on, doing an amazing job in Sacramento, really helping to lead on so many issues, environmental issues, and so much else. Very, very grateful to serve with Tasha. And also uh, to our other local elected officials, I see Kelly and Tony on here. Thank you so much for your leadership. I'm not sure if there are others as well, but uh, grateful to Kelly and Tony, of course. Uh, and, you know, this has been a good and hopeful day. And I haven't gotten to say that uh, every day. Uh, over the last three and a half years. But today has really been a good and hopeful day. Because as I looked at the calendar, I saw that I got to do an event with our uh, great mayor, Catherine Blakespear. And I also got the good news, as we all did a couple hours ago, uh, that our senator, someone uh, that I've worked with on environmental issues and on uh, housing for our military families, Kamala Harris, uh, is the pick to be the next vice president of the United States. So this is a good and hopeful day. Make no mistake, we've got a fight on our hands over the next 84 days, and we've got to do everything we can to ensure that Catherine Blakespear is reelected as the mayor of Encinitas. She cares to her bones about that city, uh, and having been, what, fourth generation, fifth generation, she knows every street, she knows every corner, she knows every house, she knows everything about that city, and she cares about every resident of that community, whether they're for her or whether they're against her and truly a model of civic engagement uh, that uh, really is uh, unsurpassed uh, in my experience working with many local elected officials. So I'm so grateful to Catherine, an amazing family, Jeremy and everybody in her family. They work so incredibly hard for the community. We must reelect them. Uh, and while we're at it, it's a new day hopefully in America in 84 days. So we've got to have no regrets when we, we wake up the morning of November 4th 2020, no regrets whatsoever that we did all we could to ensure that Catherine is reelected and that we reelect uh, people who share our values up and down the ticket. So let's work hard. Let's make it happen. If you can help out Catherine, please do so. Because as I mentioned, there's no better local elected official in our county than Catherine. So Catherine, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you for everything you do. It's great to be your partner as we move our community forward. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and that little perspective on our new vice president. I was going to ask you about that, actually. So I would hopefully, like to ask you hopefully two to questions. Be. Hopefully well, vice president to be. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So I would like to ask uh, two questions, actually, of you. So Encinitas residents across all political parties, all ages, everything care about the environment. That's, yep. that's my belief. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think we could expect from our federal government if we have a new president who wants to work with Congress to try and cool the planet? And then along those same lines, uh, so, uh, somebody submitted a question, which was uh, very short, and I'll just let you answer it too. So she says, this is from Deborah. 
saying, given that in real life, money for donations is limited, are we wiser to support you five wonderful public servants or should we use available funds to try to flip the Senate? Well, there's no wrong answer to the second question. So help however you can help. It's all important and it's all meaningful. So I would say whatever you're uh, most passionate about, whether you wanna see uh, local activism and, and more local mom momentum, or you wanna see uh, those in other states, everybody needs to help. There's no bad answer to that question. Uh, but uh, in terms of climate change and the environment, uh, this has been a passion of mine, uh, my entire professional career. And the last three and a half years have been so uh, utterly disappointing when it comes to this administration. Their attack on the environmental uh, laws that have really been the cornerstone uh, of uh, the last 60 or 70 years, many on a bipartisan basis, when you go all the way back uh, to the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, National Environmental Policy Act, and the list goes on, this administration has tried to undermine our air, our water, and our planet at every turn. Uh, and uh, it's been incredibly frustrating, but just know that had we not flipped the house in 2018, things would be far worse because we've been that check. We've been able to stop a lot of the worst instincts of this administration. Now, unfortunately, the president has put fossil fuel executives, former fossil fuel executives and lobbyists in charge of the relevant agencies. And just imagine what we could do if we had President Biden, Vice President Harris, Senate Majority Leader Schumer, and Speaker Pelosi and our current House Democratic majority. If you go to climatecrisis.house.gov, you will see the most comprehensive climate plan in the history of the US government that we put forward, the House Democrats and the Select Committee for the Climate Crisis. I was very honored to be one of the nine Democrats on that committee and seven of our bills from our office made it into that Select Committee climate plan. At a high level, the plan is actually commensurate with the science. It says zero net carbon emissions economy-wide by 2050 and the power sector by 2040. My bill, the Zero Emission Vehicles Act that I'm leading in the House along with Senator Jeff Merkley from Oregon in the Senate, that would have 100% of all new car sales be zero emission by 2035. So I know from my time with all of you in Encinitas how significant this issue is to you, clean air, clean water, the beautiful place that we all call home. This district that I serve, 52 miles of beautiful coastline, we want to keep it that way. A second Trump term will mean, uh, unfortunately, oil rigs off the coast of California, Florida, and elsewhere. It will mean uh, further undermining of our uh, bedrock environmental laws. Uh, and unfortunately, we do not have any time to spare. We have to do everything we can uh, to elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in 84 days to make sure that we get back on track and that we also restore global leadership when it comes to climate uh, issues. I got to go uh, with the speaker as part of a group of about a dozen members of the House to Madrid and to the COP25, that's the uh, annual climate conference run by the UN. It's where the Kyoto Protocol and uh, the Paris Agreement were signed. And I hope that we go back. We were supposed to go back right after the election, but we're not going this year because of COVID. We're going to go next year, knock wood, with a new administration and a new uh, focus once again on leading the world when it comes to greenhouse gas reduction and accelerating the transition to sustainable energy. The last thing I'll say, Catherine, is I'll repeat something that Joe Biden said. Joe Biden recently said, when Donald Trump thinks about climate change, the word that comes to mind is hoax. When we think about climate change, the word that comes to mind is jobs. In co with COVID, we now have millions and millions of people who need a job. And we can lead on the clean energy jobs of the future. We can lead in this new industry that will create millions and millions of new jobs. I just saw a report suggesting 25 million new jobs will be created in the next several years if we take the initiative and we lead on clean energy. So this is good for our planet, it's good for our economy, and I know it's good for our community. So we have so much to fight for over the next 83, 84 days. The very future of the planet is on the ballot. Well, thank you for that uh, information. It's fabulous. <laughs> thank um, you. Yeah.
Okay, so now I'm going to go to my city council colleague, council member Tony Kranz. He is the longest serving member of the Encinita City Council. He was elected almost eight years ago. And I value his deep roots in our community and his historic knowledge of politics and policy that goes back many years. And what's most impressive about Tony is his many ideas. He would be somebody uh, who would have an aptitude test that would show ideaphoria as being really high. He's a creative problem solver and he's a critical member of our city council team. I strongly encourage you to support him in his reelection for district one. And I will hand it over to you, council member Kranz. Well, thank you. I appreciate that introduction and uh, I'm honored to be here to have the opportunity to speak to your supporters on, on this call and uh, encourage them to make contributions to your campaign, which um, are critically important. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so campaigning is going to be different this year than it ever has been. So the opportunity to send direct mail is uh, critical and the pieces that come in your mailbox are not inexpensive so financial contributions are great and uh, i would encourage everyone to support uh, mayor blakespear um, i got this invitation and i got to thinking about uh, how strange it seems to be uh, the old man on the city council uh, i would have never dreamed to have the honor and privilege of serving uh, the city that i grew up in for this length of time and uh, it has been uh, quite an experience that uh, I will uh, forever cherish. Um, I moved to Encinitas in 1960 and uh, came with, uh, as a tiny baby with my parents. My father was a World War II Marine. And of course, uh, I have to say that Nathan Fletcher was his favorite young Marine. So um, we, uh, both my father and I uh, have always supported his efforts and we're proud happy to see him serving on the County Board of Supervisors. Um, but the other thing about my youth and growing up is that I had uh, one of the most, uh, my mother was a special woman who had leadership skills uh, un that were unusual in, in the 60s and 70s and she ended up becoming a uh, the, one of the first nurse practitioners in the community. Um, I also had four sisters, so, and they were all very strong women. Um, so I had no idea growing up how, in, how useful the experience of being around strong women would be when it came to my service on the Encinitas City Council, because between Catherine and uh, Lisa Schaefer and Jody Hubbard and Kelly, it's been uh, uh, quite uh, an experience to be able to serve on a deliberative body with such wonderful women. And Catherine uh, is certainly one of the most dynamic that has served on the Encinitas City Council. Um, we have not always agreed on things, but one of, the th one of the things that I've been very pleased about is that we have been able to disagree uh, without being disagreeable as the old saying goes. So. Um, I look forward to continuing to have the opportunity to serve with Mayor Blakespear, and um, uh, we have accomplished a lot in the years that she has been on the council, and I look forward to accomplishing even more. We've got some tremendous projects lined up, um, and uh, the financial uncertainty of, of the pandemic is certainly going to present some challenges, but that is uh, something that we've... Uh, you know, just got to learn to to deal with. And um, so working with Catherine throughout will be uh, my honor. Well, thank you, Councilmember Kranz. Let me ask you a specific question about one of those projects. So the largest infrastructure project in the city is Lucadia Streetscape. And we're scheduled to start construction on that in a few short months. And also the rail, what, railway underpass at El Portal and that's slated to begin before year end. That's actually the item, the main item on our council agenda tomorrow. Um, and so I would like to ask you, you currently are serving as the chair of the North County Transit District. And I, I would like to ask your perspective on how this will transform the way people move around Lucadia and why have you been a champion for mobility projects throughout the city during your time in office? Well, the, uh... 
Lucadia Streetscape project has been um, one of those very uh, drawn out processes that Encinitas is fairly well known for. We've been working on this for almost 15 years and I've been involved from the start because it offered the opportunity to take a piece of infrastructure that was almost 100 years old and uh, totally transform it from a very auto-centric uh, roadway to one which would embrace the ideas of complete streets, including uh, providing for uh, safer bicycling as well as uh, increasing uh, the safety of pedestrians and encouraging people to get out of their cars and come and enjoy the beautiful 101. Um, and so I look forward to the construction beginning on that project. Um, we are currently looking at the possibility of starting in the vicinity of uh, the El Portal uh, roundabout, which uh, will be an important facility to complement the El Portal undercrossing that will, um, you know, we'll be uh, looking at starting construction on that fairly soon as well. And yes, these projects, I think, are all going to be transformational. I think one of the things that we have had as a goal on the city council is to do uh, make significant mode shift uh, from the way people get around town so that people have the opportunity to get out of their cars and come and enjoy our city in uh, ways that are better for their health and I think would encourage uh, the success of businesses as well. So um, this will be, um, you know, the, the El Portal undercrossing will mean that everybody that lives in the vicinity of Paul Ecke Central School um, will be able to um, get to the businesses on the 101 without having to use either Encinitas Boulevard or Lucadia Boulevard. And so automatically it encourages people to use uh, either a bicycle or a walk to the 101. And so um, it's, it's, I think it's going to make for some very important changes in our community. And I appreciate all that you've done to promote uh, mode shifting. Uh, we've done some projects around town that um, we've, we've done using paint only because that was a uh, better than the way the, the roadways were laid out. Um, and, and I think it's been an important uh, change for um, people who want to do something other than drive. My wife and I, uh, Cynthia, who also is a longtime Encinitas resident, who also graduated from San Diego High School, um, she and I both purchased e-bikes recently from Charlie's Electric Bikes in downtown. Nico would be happy to hook anybody on the, on this call up with, with an e-bike, and I encourage it. It has been, um, uh, you know, really something that has made a big difference in our lives, and we've enjoyed getting around town by e-bike. And uh, what I've noticed about my wife, she's not as daring as I am. And so she is always looking for um, a route that includes a bike lane, even if it's painted uh, and, and not protected. So we have been getting to know the city uh, well in terms of where the safe routes are. And um, it, what it has taught me is that there, we still have a lot of work to do. And I look forward to being able to team up with, with you and the rest of my colleagues on the council to continue the efforts to create a, uh, an environment that allows people to safely walk and ride bikes around Encinitas. Well, thank you, Councilmember Kranz. And you are also in an election. So we, I encourage anybody who can to support uh, Councilmember Kranz. He is in District 1, which is on the northern uh, border of our city with Carlsbad. And I think we, you can find his donation in the um, chat over here, it was posted. Uh, and so now I'm going to go to our deputy mayor, um, council member Kelly Shahinzi. Uh, our deputy mayor is the, the newest addition to the city council. So she was appointed unanimously when Tasha Berner Horvath was elected to the assembly. So she filled into her seat and she is a millennial. She's bilingual in Spanish and she is a deep thinker. So I find Kelly to be gifted at expressing herself and concepts in a really profound way. And I very much value her connection to Lucadia and Old Encinitas. 
She served as the executive director of Lucidia 101 Main Street Association. And she's essentially a community organizer in terms of her interests and passions. She's recently put that to use organizing a mask distribution at Moonlight Beach. And she juggles all the details of fundraising and design and volunteer shifts and messaging and all the different parts that come with doing community organizing. So our deputy mayor is a star and I'm excited to support her bid for re-election or for election in district two. So I will hand it over to you to say a few words. Okay, I think I'm unmuted here. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. Um, as our mayor said, my name's Kelly Hinsey. I'm a third generation Encinitas resident, and I just have the profound honor of serving as deputy mayor this year. Um, as the mayor mentioned, I am also running for election. So I was appointed to the seat and I'm giving it all I've got to keep that seat um, for the next four years. So I think uh, somebody kindly put my website in the chat if you'd like to learn more about me or connect with me or hear my perspective, share yours on any issues. I would be so happy to be in touch with all of you. This is the first time that uh, my district, which is District 2 downtown Old Encinitas, will be voting for a district specific representative. So a lot of folks don't know that yet. So please check what district you're in. Um, it is really such an honor to be here in support of Mayor Blake Spears reelection. To me, her leadership has always reflected unity, it's reflected courage, and it's reflected clarity. Before I had the honor of serving alongside her here on city council, I always referred to her as our fearless mayor because she was not afraid of controversy. And she taught other young leaders in the community that controversy doesn't necessarily dictate your decisions. You need to do what is right based on your values, even if it is a hard decision to make. So the mayor has always shown up um, for different events that I used to put on. She would show up to support different community-led organization um, in, in our city. And so she was very visible, very approachable. And I always valued that in her. And now I value that even more because I've seen what she does to inspire a young women leader in our city. Um, I know I speak for a lot of women of my generation who look at her and see that her vision balances what we love about Encinitas and also how to transform what's necessary to meet the present challenges because the challenges we faced five, 10 years ago are so different from the ones that we're facing now. Um, uh, there was another mayor who I really respect, another female mayor, and she really put this challenge perfectly. She said, there are two things that people hate above all else. It is change and it's no change. And so to be able to be a mayor who's navigating the reality that neither of those two outcomes are fully possible, um, our mayor has the best perspective to do that. Um, not only does she have the deep roots in our community here, but also a deep understanding of where we've been and where we're trying to go. So without question, Mayor Blake Spears is the right person to ensure our best possible future. Well, thank you, Deputy Mayor. That's so nice of you to say all those things. Um, let me ask you a specific question. So I have um, found you to be an advocate for greater equity and programs that promote inclusion and diversity. And I'd like to ask you why you felt it was important to support the parking lot for people who've lost their homes to stay overnight in their cars. And what do you think we could be doing to make our community more diverse? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I'll start by answering sort of the, the most basic of the question, which is why did I support safe parking? Um, safe parking was a tangible solution. So it's how you describe, you know, you can say one thing, but actually doing something to solve that problem is an entirely different challenge. So to inform the decision about safe parking, I actually went to one of the safe parking programs that was already up and running by Jewish Family Service and met with their clients, asked them about their experience, learned about their backgrounds, and kind of came to understand who, who, who we're trying to serve here with this, with this opportunity. So moving forward into the vote, I had firsthand experience. We had the comprehensive data that would help support this program. And I've seen that it's directly applicable to my city and some of the challenges that our residents face. Um, you know, even with all the different community perspectives aside, the, our opponents, everybody in the city agrees that we do not want homelessness to increase in our city. And so this program has already shown us that we can curb the existing um, homelessness that we, that we have and that we can find more solutions to keep it from, from increasing. But I would also like to answer that question on a personal level because I am the daughter of two public school teachers. Um, my mom, Julie Hinsey, she's here on this call. 
Um, she taught with Encinitas Union School District for 30 years, and most of her career she was at Pawlecki uh, Elementary School, which is where I went to school as well. And Pawlecki is, is located in a very affluent part of our community, but yet there's still so many students there who, whose families are facing economic hardship. And the parents of Pawlecki Central have done a tremendous job of, of harnessing volunteer support for the families that are, that are on the brink of homelessness in our city. Um, seeing what they've made available to meet the needs of their children's classmates really weighed heavily into the decision that we made about safe parking um, because these groups were already up and running. They were already supporting these families prior to coronavirus. Um, so given what I knew about this community, I knew who the experts were who were already facing these challenges firsthand. So I went to them and I asked them if this was a program that would be helpful and they indicated that it was most definitely helpful. So I think the challenge we face here is that for most people in Encinitas, it's really hard to imagine how close we're living to homelessness, how close we're living to people and families who are experiencing homelessness or on the brink of it. And so from going back to the experience that I had as being a teacher's daughter in Encinitas, I always knew the kids in her class who were struggling more than the rest. And even though my mom took considerable care to, to you know, not make that apparent to the rest of the students, um, she, we had enough experiences in our household that, that I came to see who those students were. So, you know, I remember one time it was a third grader, um, her mom, single mom, had just earned enough money that month to pay the rent, but that meant that they were going to go without a meal. And so that student came to our home for dinner. And I remember saying to my mom, she looks just like me. She dresses like me and I would never know that she's homeless. And so it wasn't until having that up close experience that you really come to see exactly how many people are facing that challenge. And specifically, even while we're on the call right now, there are people who are worrying about where their next paycheck's coming from and how they're gonna make their rent. So now more than ever, economic hardship that's facing our community members is evident. And um, I still have friends and neighbors who are experiencing homelessness due to the displacement that they've experienced from within this community. So while the income levels have increased, um, so have the cost of housing. And that's something that I think we really need to be realistic about here in the city of Encinitas. So there's no doubt that we have big challenges ahead. Um, getting through these challenges are gonna demand the city leadership that's tenacious and visionary and unifying and Mayor Blakespeare, you are all those things. Um, I think the colleagues that are here on this call reflect that, those values as well. And more than anything, it's important that we keep our cities united, leadership strong, moving forward, and we really can't be derailed when there's so many important things that are on the line. Well, thank you, Deputy Mayor. She's also running for re-election, or for, sorry, for election, and there is her website and a donate on the, in the chat right there. And it would be great to support her. I hope all of the candidates who are currently in office are re-elected. So I'm gonna turn it over to our, the supervisor and see where we are. Thank you, uh, thank you, Catherine. I'm back, I apologize, I had to step away for a second. Um, and uh, Kelly, great job. Uh, man, you all have a uh, incredible bench there in Encinitas, really good things. I know my, my brother-in-law is always like, man, you gotta watch the deputy mayor, she's sharp. She's gonna do really good things. So uh, I, know, I know you all are doing great. And that was a, a really good walkthrough, I think, of the reality of the challenge we face when we're trying to confront issues of homelessness, and poverty, uh, and housing. And, uh, you know, an, an analogy I've heard a lot is, you know, we're all in this boat, you know, you hear people say, you know, you can fix it, you can't fix it here. And it's the equivalent of someone saying there's a leak in your side of the boat. You know, and if you've ever been in a boat, you don't care. We're all in this together and we have to all be a part of the solution. And I've really appreciated watching leaders in Encinitas step up and confront those difficult realities uh, and being willing to take the right position uh, in spite of a whole lot of public comment and, and opposition that you get. And so com com uh, my uh, hat is off to, uh, to both of you for, for what you're doing. Uh, let's get a uh, let's get an update here on who's giving. So uh, Robin Sales, uh, Tasha texted me. She said she already donated. She's already maxed out. She's like, you didn't read my name because I didn't give the day. So I want to make sure I recognize Tasha for doing it. Uh, I see Molly Woods Drake on here. Uh, last time I saw Molly, we were getting arrested together. It was for a really good cause. But uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Molly, for uh, donating. Teresa Acosta, uh, Tom Cozens, Marlene, and Tom Scott, uh, Shri Lynn Magruder. Uh, Simon Majewski, uh, Peggy Cozens, uh, Jim Simcoe, Stephen Larkey, Robert Ayers, uh, Brad Hansen, Kay Coleman, Susan Hayes, Lisa Jordan, Marilyn Gold, Jennifer Santusio, 
I did not get that right. But Jennifer, thank you for donating. Uh, Carol Skilgen, Linda Olofsson, Barry Raskin, William Paxton, Hunter Jones Phillips, Jerry Flynn Poland, Kathy Fowler, uh, Katie Mattingly, Bill Sparks, Cheryl Bodie, Jessica Pressman, Joyce Merberg, Carol Parker. Hey, we're doing good. This is a really good event. We're really doing good. So you still have time uh, to come in and donate. Uh, let's make sure we get every possible dollar in uh, for Catherine that we can. Uh, we, we know how important this race is. We know we all support her. Um, but again, you got you to step up with your, uh, with your donations and, and your fundraising. So let's, let's keep it going. We still got a little ways to go. Well, thank you. That's a lot of names. I'm so impressed and grateful. Names. That's thank great. You. Yes, thank you. And I know a lot of those people. And some I don't know as well, but some I know. And I'm just so grateful to, to have that support. So thank you. So I'm going to ask the supervisor a question here. So I have found that the county and its health department are a model in communication and leading decision making with the science. And I'd like to ask you today the direction that you see things going and whether you expect any new regulations or enforcement actions from the county that could help us reduce our daily positivity rate. Yeah. And then I'd also like to invite you to share some thoughts about the importance of the supervisor race that we have here in Encinitas yeah. um, and what positive changes at the county level you might expect to see if Tara Lawson-Remmer wins the supervisor seat. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm going to try and be brief on this because I think about COVID um, almost every waking minute of the day in terms of what we're doing. And you know, one of the, we, we face a lot of challenges when it, when it comes to COVID. We face challenges of historic inequities. Uh, that COVID didn't create, but has really shined a bright light on them uh, and is exasperating those inequities. And we've got to move policies to try and get through those while we think about how we fundamentally rebuild. And that's the effort of our COVID equity task force with Catherine. You're a great leader on, and I appreciate that. Um, we have a, a challenge in the reality in the world today is, is, you know, when I was a kid, we all watched ABC, CBS, or NBC, and we had the same basis of fact. And then your family would put the uh, values or ideological lens through they viewed the world was how they would look at that basis of fact that we had a basis of fact. And today we don't have that. You know, Jim Desmond will go on his YouTube with someone who's just talking crazy nonsense shit that is just factually untrue, but he holds the same position I have. And so people watching that will say, well, if a supervisor is saying, then that must be true. And so we end up half the time fighting things that is not a disagreement. If someone would say, Catherine, you know what? I get the face covering. I get it slows the spread. But you know what? This is America and you can't make me cover up my face and the price of liberty means sometimes people got to die. Okay, I think you're nuts, but you're at least being intellectually honest. But that's not the debate we have, right? We have debates about nonsense conspiracy theories and it makes it really challenging. And, and where we have legitimate ideological differences, we should debate those differences. But responding to a global pandemic is a time where we ought to just work the problem. Because whether your concern is solely about a business being open or your concern is about people not dying, we do the same thing to accomplish both. It's the same thing. Wear the mask. Avoid large indoor settings. Physically distance from non-household members. Wash your hands. And, and so getting in this mindset where the actions we take, regardless of which outcome you're most concerned about, get us there, um, has has been a, a great challenge and that this is not some concocted conspiracy to, to hurt Trump, you know, and so that that's been a challenge that we faced. And then I, I think the last thing I'll say is the the other problem we face is we're just not a terribly patient people. And 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 we're, we're not as adept at we want instant, instant gratification, instant relief, instant tell me everything's okay. Um, and and so the the, the notion that that we got it. We have to settle into the new normal until we, not forever, not forever, just until we get a vaccine or therapeutic treatment and they're going to come. But the new normal means every day we live our life on those four pillars I just outlined. And so we, we have this notion about, I talk a lot of times in, in like a mountain climbing analogy, most accidents on significant mountain climbs are on the descent because we feel like we made it and then we're done. Right. And so, like right now, when I stepped off, I had to do an interview and they said, well, if we get off the state watch list, everything's good. And I said, no, see, that's the problem with the mindset, right? This is a marathon that we're going to run all the way through. And so the goal is not to get below the state watch list. The goal is to get our case count down and keep it down 
all the way through. And if you go back to 1918 and you look at the entities, and some of this is just human nature, but if you go back to 1918, the last time we were in a situation where we didn't have a pharmacological intervention, so you only had non-pharmacological interventions, closing things down, physical distancing, wearing face coverings, we're doing the same thing they did 102 years ago. The, if you go in the jurisdictions in America, there were basically two categories. There were categories that did not move swiftly enough early enough, and they saw significant early spikes. In present day, that would be New York. And that spike shook them because they saw their healthcare systems overwhelmed. They saw what would happen. And when they came out of it, they generally came down and stayed relatively low. And then on the flip side in 1918, jurisdictions who did what we did, we were very proactive. We were one of the very first counties to declare a public health emergency three weeks before we had a single local case because we knew what was coming. We did not see significant early waves. And in 1918, entities that did that, almost every one of them came out too fast, too hot, with too little focus, and they saw second waves that triggered the reimposition uh, of those restrictions. And so I think we've done this roller coaster one time, and my hope is coming out of it, we can accept the science, we can accept the data, we can wear the damn face coverings, avoid the large indoor gatherings, wash our hands, physically distance around household members, and let's keep this case count down because I believe we can get most aspects of our life back minus large indoor gatherings. But absent that, so much of what we enjoy and love we can do and protect public health and protect our most vulnerable residents uh, and protect our economy. And so that's our, our challenge moving forward is there's never a good time for a pandemic, but when you're at your most divided point, not only ideologically, but what is truth is a really challenging time uh, to, uh, to work through these. And I promise you, no one, uh, you know, I was on a series of 4-1 losing votes on expedited reopenings. And it's not because I hate businesses, because I wanted when businesses open for them to be able to stay open. Um, and we had to do that a little slower. And so, you know, I think we've got a ways to go as we go through this. Um, I really think that second only to Catherine Blake Spears race, the most important race in San Diego County uh, is the District 3 Board of Supervisors race. Um, because the reality is, very clear. Uh, you know, we've been able to have a, a good run at the county. I have a good partnership with Diane Jacob. We don't agree on everything, but I greatly respect Diane Jacob. She takes her job serious. She shows up. She knows what she's doing. Uh, good relationship with Greg Cox. We've been able to cobble together three votes on a, on a series of things to be a step in the right direction. Not as, not as much as I would have liked, but a step. Um, but the reality is that, that we're going to win in Cox's seat. You know, either way, we're going to have a more progressive voice. Uh, it's all coming down to D3 because Diane's gone. And, and we're going to face as a choice of the county is are we going to continue with this 1970s approach to governing, which is what will happen if you have uh, whoever wins Diane seat, Jim Desmond and Kristen Gaspar, or are we actually going to embrace the future where we build houses in the right place in the right way, where we fund transit, recognizing that, that we don't need an eight track approach in the iTunes world. Like the world has changed, we gotta fundamentally rethink. Do we fundamentally tackle issues of equity and fairness and environmental justice? Do we have a climate action plan that is real and meaningful and allows us to move forward? And, and all of those things we can have indescribable progress on if we elect Tara Lawson Reamer in D3. And so I would really encourage everyone, please, if you care about the issues we're dealing with, and, and it has a huge impact, our ability to partner with local cities on like-minded projects and efforts, our ability to work with a new presidential administration uh, and with a Congress and a leadership, Congressman Levin and others, um, you know, the impacts of what happens at the county, we're not just this almost $8 billion a year entity with 18,000 employees, which is significant, the largest governing body in San Diego County, but the impact we have on bodies like Sandac and the airport authority and MTS and others is significant. And so I really do think this is a very important race um, and I'm really hopeful that all of you will, uh, will, will consider supporting Tara. Well, thank you for that. Um, we are at time, but I'm going to go and answer some questions because we have a lot of them in the q and I I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, but I'm going to answer one and then I'm gonna, going to ask the Congressman one that's there specifically for him from Anonymous. You could take a look at it, Congressman Levin, if you want to see. But I'm just going to answer one that's from Marilyn first that she says, how do I combat the attacks against you regarding people that think you underhandedly approve the homeless parking lot? I find so many people blaming you for things that they are so uninformed about. 
So I'll answer that by saying, I think it's common for people who don't like the substantive answer on something to claim that there was a process problem. So it's a, it's a common tactic. Um, and I will say that with the homeless parking lot, this might seem obvious, but there is a period where there's not an idea and then there is an idea. So when there is an idea, what do you do with that? And what I do with that as the mayor is I say, put it in writing and submit it to the city attorney so that the city council can consider it officially. And that is exactly what we did with the homeless parking lot. So we did, we had the meetings in public. We had more than one meeting in public. We asked the parties to go with the city and negotiate terms. We reviewed the terms. We had, we had um, all of the process that would be part of a deliberative decision making. And so I don't feel that that is a legitimate criticism. I feel that we followed what, what is appropriate and we also made a decision about an idea that was in front of us. And I'll just give as, as an example, if somebody wants to buy a piece of property that we own, they will submit something to us and say, I want to do this with your property. So could, will you consider it? And how do we deal with that? We have our city attorney look at it. We consider it in closed session. And then we make that decision to take it to open session and talk about it or not. So I, I, don't, I don't see this as being different from other things that we've done, but I do think it goes back to opposition to, um, to the homeless parking lot in the first place. So I will uh, go to the question that is for the Congressman now. So he, this question is at the federal level, are any types of WPA like funding being entertained or discussed? Well, um, yes, but unfortunately, we don't have bipartisan agreement uh, right now. You know, we passed our Moving Forward Act, HR2, our big infrastructure bill, a billion and a half, or excuse me, a trillion and a half dollar infrastructure bill. Uh, and it includes a lot of uh, public works measures comparable uh, to what uh, Franklin Roosevelt put in place. You know, we are really at a crossroads because of COVID-19. Uh, we know the 32.9% GDP drop. Uh, we know the tens of millions of unemployed now 20 weeks in a row with a million or more filing for unemployment insurance. And we're going to really need a massive jobs program in the United States. Uh, and I think we have a decision to make whether we want to handle the current crisis, the economic crisis that we are dealing with uh, more like Franklin Delano Roosevelt or more like Herbert Hoover uh, after the Great Depression. I know which I'd rather be on the side of. I, I hope that we are up to the challenge. And so uh, what we uh, intend to do uh, is to bring things back like the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, to uh, really take a hard look at those investments we can make in infrastructure to, to lead in the 21st century again. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that clean energy is a great uh, way to do it. We know that it will uh, not only yield significant uh, environmental gains, but also really help position the United States, as I mentioned before, to lead the way uh, with those clean energy jobs of the future. So I'm going to do everything I can. And I think uh, the Biden uh, infrastructure proposal is far more in line. Uh, and look, the president said, President Trump said he wanted a $2 trillion infrastructure plan. Uh, he just doesn't want to have to pay for it. And unfortunately, that $2 trillion is exactly what uh, we spent with that, I say we, what the uh, Trump administration and the Republicans in Congress decided to spend uh, on their tax plan in 2017, where 83% of the benefit went to the top 1% of taxpayers, adding $2 trillion to our debt. So imagine if we would have taken that $2 trillion instead and invested it uh, in infrastructure and the clean energy jobs of the future. So. I hope that's where we are going with the Biden administration. I think it's where we are. I know that uh, Senator Harris is a strong supporter of that proposal as well. Uh, and hopefully in 84 days, that's where we're headed. Okay, thank you for that. I'm gonna um, pose one of these questions to the deputy mayor and then I'll answer one about the bike lanes on 101 and the accidents after that. So this is the question that says, what is the plan to deal with the homeless population that seems to be growing worse in our community? I understand the draw because of resources, location, and climate, which is why I choose to live in Encinitas, but a lot of these people are dangerous due to their mental health issues and unsanitary lifestyle. 
I'm beginning to feel unsafe in our community. Does the deputy mayor want to answer that? Yeah, sure. I'll do my best. Um, it's a really complex issue, but I think the truth that we know is that homelessness begins at home. And so there's this notion that we're that the homeless population that we have in Encinitas has migrated here from some other place. And I don't think that that's an accurate picture. Um, there's a really great news article by Cal Matters, which I'm happy to put in the chat, um, that indicates people living on the streets are typically from surrounding neighborhoods. So for example, in San Francisco, 70% of the homeless population had once been housed in San Francisco. In Los Angeles, the same is true for three quarters of the homeless population there. So when we talk about homelessness in Encinitas, we're often talking about locals who have lived here and lost their homes here. So understanding that is the first step to understanding this issue. Um, so a local issue demands local solutions and we need to provide the resources here in Encinitas where we see the homelessness happening because my fear is that by turning a blind eye, we're only allowing the problem to worsen. So as was mentioned earlier in this call, we can expect an uptick in homelessness. So between the pandemic and economic calamity, there's tremendous suffering and hard times are only likely to get harder for those experiencing homelessness or close to it. And so we need to be prepared in the city of Encinitas and we need to be realistic. And so, you know, our city is so idyllic in many ways, but we are no, by no means immune from the ripple effects that surround us in the bigger world. And we need to continue to remind ourselves that we're living through a moment of historic hardship and that being cognizant of our most vulnerable population, the homeless men, women, children, who, who are our fellow community members is gonna help us achieve resiliency and come out of this crisis as a stronger community. So specifically, you know, that's more of the, the context of homelessness in Encinitas, but specifically this city council has done a heavy amount of outreach surrounding homelessness and there's no way that we're going to come up with a great solution if the community is not part of it. And so we really need the community to take part in that. And um, we will have another um, homeless action plan uh, outreach opportunity. It is virtual, but it's on August 17th, I believe. Um, and it will be presented to the community for another round of input on our homeless action plan. So I encourage everybody on this call to take part. Um, We've also responded to some of the community concerns of homelessness with, the, with HOPE, which is the Homeless Outreach Program for Empowerment. And it's a program that enables law enforcement to couple with a social worker and help identify people who are living here in Encinitas um, and what their crisis might be and then get them back into housing. So just to wrap up, I think I wanna address this fear that homeless people will drive crime rates higher. And it's important to take a moment to underscore how remarkably safe Encinitas is. So I know it was mentioned that we're the safest, second safest city in the county, but we're also the 29th safest city in the entire state of California. Um, and this success that we have as the second safest city in the county is a testament to the local leadership that we have in place um, and another indicator that we need to keep it in place. So, you know, it's evident from the conversations we've had of late with law enforcement that they need more support to better handle the mental health challenges that they're encountering on a daily basis. Um, and fortunately, thanks to Supervisor Fletcher, we're, we're gonna see increased funding for mental health, especially in those um, mobile crisis response units. And my hope that we can do more at the city level to prevent mental health crises from taking place in the first place. And so by focusing on the prevention of those crises, um, you know, if they do happen, we will have those mobile crisis units in place. But I think that the focus needs to be on prevention and specifically in strategies rooted in compassion, dignity, practicality, and I'll say it one last time, but community. Well, thank you for that. As you can see, like I said, she is a profound thinker and can express herself in such great ways. Um, I'm so happy to have her as part of our team. Um, so I'm going to um, ask Councilman Burkrantz the question, what is your long-term vision for the rail corridor in the city of Encinitas from Diana? But I'm before that, I'm gonna answer the question that was posed about the bike lane. So it was from Steve, there have been at least 20 serious accidents along the new bike path in Cardiff. This is the protected bike lane. What is being done to reduce the number of accidents along the new bike path? So I just wanna say that I, when I hear reports of accidents, I become alarmed too. So we never want to be building things that are dangerous or that are putting people at risk. 
And so I have asked our city staff about to do an analysis of these alleged accidents. And so they went onto Facebook and pulled the list that people are reporting 20 or more accidents. And I think there are a couple of things that are important to note. One is that the official records are just not consistent with that Facebook page. So the official records are not indicating that there is a huge spike of accidents. And then also incidents are different from accidents. So we have had things like, for example, a jaywalker who trips over the curb and skins his knee or, or, or hat falls down. But that's not an accident. So that's just an incident that's basically unrelated. So my experience of that bike path, which is substantial, and I think a lot of people um, it is, because they go down there, I drive by it a lot, I ride it, I walk it, is that it's heavily used. And so people are out there now that weren't out there before, and they're, you're having to share space. So it's a protected bike path where people who are walking with their uh, dogs, with their surfboards, are also nearby people who are cycling. And in many ways, the cyclists who are used to having a wide open road and felt comfortable with that, they have had to make more changes than others because there are now more people who are using it. But, but I, I think the goal of that is to provide more ways for people to get to the beach, to go through Cardiff and get to Solana Beach and beyond without being in their car. And that facility is just without question a success. It's, it, it allows for safety, for people to feel safe on their bike who did not feel safe before and did not ride it before. So I think it's fantastic. And I do, if there are accidents that are based on any particular thing, I want us to remedy those. But the, because like I said, the official records are not supporting that. So we, I also want to note that it is not finished. So right now there's a section that's being built, a sidewalk section, and there, is, there was some netting there, and now they've replaced that with cones. And the, the contractor is responsible for making sure that people aren't endangering themselves while it's under construction. But it, if somebody is, falls off or there's a, a collision or a conflict during the construction time, I don't think that's also a, a reflection on whether it will be safely operating or is a safe facility. So we have put in a lot of signage. We're doing, um, we've changed all our message boards now to be about COVID, not about the bike path. But um, there's paint, there are, there, there's information campaigns, there's the, all the electronic media. So I think we'll continue to be doing those things. Um, but this is a really successful facility and it, it is providing that access that wasn't there before. So, so um, I continue to feel like it is really, truly a great improvement for more people. So with that, I will go to um, the question from, for Council Member Kranz. Diana had a number of questions, but um, I'm just gonna go to the third one, which, uh, what is your long-term vision of the rail corridor in the city of Encinitas? Yes, thanks for the question. I think that my long-term vision is very similar to most of the community, which is to make the rail corridor a better neighbor. And when you have uh, the requirement to hear train horns that pass through our town, they have to sound their horn four times, it can rattle windows and really uh, become very unpleasant. Uh, I live a couple of blocks from the tracks and uh, it's pretty noisy here. I can't imagine if I lived on Vulcan. Um, since uh, I became actively involved in politics in Encinitas, uh, I have been advocating for at-grade rail crossings through northern uh, Lucadia. And uh, when I took a seat on the city council, uh, I made it my goal to, to try and establish uh, some at-grade crossings. Uh, we started by allocating money to put in at-grade crossing at Montgomery as part of the Coastal Rail Trail project. Um, but what we found was that there were uh, opponents to that uh, approach. And so we shifted gears to the much more expensive grade separated crossing. And um, that seems to be the obviously the more popular route to go. Furthermore, it's a very difficult bureaucratic um, maze uh, to get through uh, at grade crossing. So there is that uh, challenge of the bureaucracy and uh, uh, Congressman Levin may be enlisted to help us try and navigate the Federal Railroad Administration, 
Uh, we may have to ask uh, Assemblywoman Tasha Berner Horvath to help us with the California Public Utilities Commission, which is the agency that manages railroads in, in the state of California. Both agencies have stated a uh, policy of not adding any additional act rate crossings. The reality is, and, and believe me, the, one of the first questions that I asked of the ex executive director of the North County Transit District in a meeting with uh, the Sandeg representative at the time, Lisa Schaefer, we asked about uh, pursuing great separation of the tracks by lowering them below Lucadia Boulevard. And uh, the challenge with a, pro a project like that is that it does not benefit the North County Transit District in any way. It does not increase operations. It doesn't allow for more trains to go. It does make life better for the residents of Encinitas. And therefore, the North County Transit District position is that if it, you want it to happen, you need to make it happen as a city. You see that happening in Carlsbad. Uh, the difference between Encinitas and Carlsbad when it comes to revenue in their budget is significantly different. And so um, we have always been, uh, had a much uh, more challenging economic, you know, fiscal environment. And so we've been working on projects that have long been uh, on the drawing board first. And so we have not uh, really pursued the grade separating. Um, I will add that the mid 2000s, there was a study done by the city that looked at a number of options for grade separation of the stretch of tracks through Lucadia, as well as throughout the entire city. And those, those uh, studies proved that the cost on that was uh, prohibitive for the city of Encinitas. So we're up against a lot of obstacles. Um, my, my, goal at this point is to continue pursuing more safe and legal ways to cross the tracks. If we can convince the FRA and CPUC that, um, you know, in, in North Lucadia grade sep uh, at grade crossings would be safe, then, then I will do that. Right now we're looking at um, some alternatives to the more expensive uh, engineered crossings like we're getting at uh, El Portal and like was built at Santa Fe and like is being designed for um, Verde and Cardiff. And we may be able to do uh, some crossings in a, that are m much more uh, cost effective, but there are challenges with those as well. So uh, I will be continuing to advocate for more safe and legal crossings. And I will also be working to um, have the quiet zone that we managed to get installed as part of the double tracking project in Cardiff so that uh, we put enough gates up and pedestrian gates that now when trains cross at Chesterfield, uh, they don't have to sound their horns. And we have a federally approved quiet zone there. And the only time you will hear horns is when the engineer sees somebody in the rail corridor that they consider to be in danger, they will sound their horns. But other than that, there are no requirements for the four uh, horns to be sounded either direction. And uh, all the feedback that I've received from folks in uh, Cardiff is that uh, it's a dream, dream world. And I really want to extend that throughout the rest of the city, um, which means uh, in preliminary studies, we've seen the cost to do that would be between 12 and $15 million. Um, that re requires additional gates at E Street, D Street, as well as in the train station. And then ultimately, uh, the northernmost uh, gate improvements would need to be done at Lucadia Boulevard. Um, we would then apply to the Federal Railroad Administration for a quiet zone, and hopefully we would have uh, train operations throughout the city that uh, that didn't didn't have the noise of the horns. Uh, North County Transit District, in large part due to some support we got at Sandag from Mayor Blakespear, uh, has recently purchased uh, two new train sets. We've ordered two new train sets. We are also uh, getting five new locomotives. Um, these are all tier four emissions. Um, they were purchased in part through grants through the Carl Moyer program through. Uh, um, the Air Quality Control Board that uh, Supervisor Fletcher serves on. And so these are all very important improvements to the railroad. Um, but we also 
can expect over the next 10 or so years that there will be an increase in uh, rail traffic to include more freight trains that will be running during the day. Uh, the two new train sets that were purchased uh, by NCT are intended to allow for um, trains to be uh, running every half hour. So they're every half hour during peak periods of commute would be, you would be able to catch a train at the Encinitas station and then uh, off peak would be every hour. So um, we are making some headway um, with, with the uh, coaster service and I hope we can continue to do that. Uh, Congressman Levin has been very helpful to uh, secure funding to make some very important improvements to the rail corridor in Del Mar. And um, these are the sort of projects that's known as state of good repair. Um, my hope is that we see some wholesale change in Washington, DC, and we get some infrastructure bills that will allow us to do even more of this uh, state of good repair work in, in uh, the Encinitas, excuse me, in the NCTD operations area, there are uh, about a billion dollars worth of projects that are needed for state of good repair. So again, I'm looking to make the railroad corridor a little better neighbor. Uh, it's been there 140 years and we have a uh, city that has grown up around it and very little change has happened to the corridor over the years and we need to continue to advocate uh, for more safe and legal crossings as well as quieter trains. And on cue, you can hear the train in the background, perhaps. I know, that's such a great way to end with the train right there. <laughs> um, okay, well, we th I'm going to thank everybody for staying an extra half an hour here um, and participating in this. It's been great, and I'm really thrilled by all the enthusiasm and by the other people who are on this call, the panelists, and all of you for participating. Uh, you can continue to donate. Um, I'm going to read the last council member or supervisor Fletcher had to leave. So I'm going to read the last people who I got notice of, which were Dorothy Denny, Deanne Sabeck, Eve Simmons, Alan Schmidt, Amy Freeman, and Marla Strick. Thank you so much for donating, everybody, and for participating. And um, I will see you soon. So thank you so much. Bye bye.